Hi everyone, Professor Gassimi here. In this component of the lecture, we're going to be speaking about context-free grammars. Now, a context-free grammar is just a set of rules, or sometimes referred to as productions, that express the ways that tokens in a language can be grouped, ordered, and classified into a hierarchical grammatical structure. So, for example, a very, very simple production on the right specifies the parts of speech class of words from an example vocabulary. You can see here that these rules say, I'm going to consider anything that is in this list of words, cat, fish, chicken, fat, road, to be a noun. I'm going to consider ate, yawned, and crossed to be verbs, and so on and so forth for each of the parts of speech tags that might exist in a language. Now, the symbols that correspond to words in the language are called terminal symbols. So these symbols, these are, these are the terminal symbols in the language. They're sort of the end uh, tokens that you might see in some data that you're analyzing. And the set of rules that introduce the terminal symbols is referred to as a lexicon. So that is to say that these rules that tell you how you map from the individual words in your vocabulary to their part of speech tags is called a lexicon. Now we can add as many rules as we want to a context-free grammar, um, far beyond just the lexicon. I mean, we can add as many rules as we want. For instance, the production on the right defines a noun phrase to be composed of a determiner here and a nominal, which we define to be one or more nouns. So you can see I said a nominal is a noun or a nominal and a noun. So this has a recursive property that says basically a nominal is one or more nouns. And therefore a noun phrase is a determiner. That's the, a, an, this, these, that, followed by one or more nouns. Okay, And I can define this just as a rule to say this is what a noun phrase is. Now if we come up with a proper set of rules, we can use these context-free grammars to parse text or to generate text that adheres to the rules of the grammar that we specified. It's a very simple idea, right? It's just effectively writing um, uh, a set of if statements that would exist on top of your, your language as you parse it. We could use the context-free grammar on the right here to parse text or to generate it. So the fat cat ate chicken, for instance, let's say we wanted to parse that sentence. Um, well, here's how the parser would sort of work. We'd start with the first token in this sequence, the, and we'd say, okay, let's come to our grammar rules now and figure out um, what is the class of the. Well, we said the was a determiner, so I'm going to give this a, uh, a marker that says it's a determiner. This could be, for example, stored in a, a dictionary if you were doing this in Python, or it could be stored in a list or however you wanted to do it. But we keep track of the fact that the word the in the sentence is now uh, a part of the determiner class. And then similarly, we'd go down our list of grammar rules and we'd say, oh, fat, cat, and chicken are all nouns. And finally, we'd come to the third rule in the in the grammar and we'd say eight is a verb and we would have now for each of these tokens inside of our sequence what their part of speech tag was according to the grammar rule that we specified. Okay and now moving from these very simple rules of grammar to get the part of speech tags to getting more complicated grammatical structures is follows the exact same sequence. I said down here that a nominal was a noun followed by either another nominal and noun or, um, or, or just the noun, obviously. And so if I come over here, I can see I've got a noun followed by a noun, so this is a nominal, right? And you can see I'm sort of, this is starting to look almost tree-like because I've got uh, a nominal is a combination of two of these lower order things which are themselves um, a function of the, the terminal token. 
Okay, and similarly, I could then follow this last rule to generate the noun phrase, which is the determiner, v, followed by the nominal, fat cat. And I would know that this whole red text segment here is the noun phrase. And so I've effectively parsed this sentence, right, into the fat cat as the noun phrase, the verb, which is eight, and, you know, what that uh, verb is acting on, which is chicken, which is a noun. Now, the bracket notation that I've shown here is shorthand for what's called a parse tree that describes the final outcome of following the rules in our context-free grammar. So, for example, this first noun phrase that we generated together in the previous slide was a determiner, as you see here, followed by a nominal, which you see here. And furthermore, the determiner was terminating in the, which we show here, and the nominal consisted of two nouns, fat and cat, which I show here. And similarly, we can follow um, the same kind of policy here, except that this obviously isn't embedded within any kind of structure, so these just link to their, their terminal. Now, what's important about this very simple idea of a context-free grammar is not only that you can use it to parse sentences according to the rules you specify, the grammar rules you specify here specifically, you could also use it to generate text, right? I could say, I might be interested in generating a noun phrase. And so, well, I know that a noun phrase is a determiner followed by a nominal, so I could just come here and let's say I could randomly choose one of the determiners, such as these, and I plop that in here. And then I say, okay, well, what's next is I'm gonna need a nominal, which is one or more of these. So let's say I arbitrarily grab two, and I just concatenate them into, um, to serve as the, the purpose of the nominal. Well. I now have, according to the rules of the grammar that I've specified here, generated a, uh, a sentence that adheres to the rules of the grammar, these chicken cat. Obviously, this isn't a very sensible sentence, but as we're going to see a little bit later in the lecture, there's uh, ways to attach probabilities to some of these rules so that you can generate uh, sentences that have a little bit more sense to them than what I've shown here. The key thing I want you to take away from this conversation about context-free grammars is actually just how simple they are, and how, but also how powerful, right? It's a, basically a series of, uh, you know, kind of if statements or rules that we follow when we're defining what the language is. And even though it's simple, if you can specify these properly, a context-free grammar can be used to, to formally define a language and all sentences that can be derived from the, that language. So for example, I've got here a set of grammar rules that come from the textbook. It's obviously a very simplified set of grammar rules that says how we generate sentences in English. And this set of grammar rules um, puts forward the proposal that a sentence is a noun phrase that's followed by a verb phrase. And then it says that a noun phrase is either a pronoun or it's a proper noun or, and this is what we saw before, determiner followed by a nominal. And as we saw before, a nominal is a nominal followed by a noun or it's just a noun. And a verb phrase is either a verb, a verb followed by a noun phrase, a verb followed by a noun phrase followed by a prepositional phrase, or a verb phrase followed by a prepositional phrase. And a prepositional phrase is just a preposition and a noun phrase. Now note here that I didn't include uh, the rules of the lexicon. Those are usually sort of specified separately because they can get quite long. And again, the lexicon is just how we map from the terminating tokens, the key or the raw words in your uh, text to their parts of speech categories. Now, we can apply the rules of CFGs break any sentence into its constituent grammatical components, right? So for example, if I had the sentence, I prefer 
a morning flight, as you can see here at the terminal parts of the tree. I can follow the context-free grammar rules that I specified in the last slide to know that this sentence consists of a noun phrase and a verb phrase. The noun phrase here is specifically the pronoun I, and the verb phrase is a verb followed by a noun phrase. The verb is prefer, and the noun phrase is a morning flight, where the noun phrase is constructed of a determiner followed by a nominal, a morning flight. Now, you can see by glancing at this that being able to extract this kind of structure from your language might be very useful. Why might it be useful? Well, I might be interested in always understanding what the noun phrase of a particular sentence is to help me with classification, for instance, of a person's request. Um, or I might want to know something about, let's say, when you have a verb phrase, what that verb phrase is sort of acting on, as in, what is the noun phrase component of the verb phrase? So that if somebody's um, asking a search engine, for example, to find something, I can, I can identify, maybe by focusing my attention on, on this part of it, um, how to constrain my search more effectively. Okay. But in general, this is useful because it provides uh, features for algorithms, especially when you have uh, an absence of data. Now, parse trees are also useful in applications such as grammatical checking in um, word processing systems, for example. Um, actually, the way that Microsoft Word and, and many other packages that indicate you have a grammar error flag a sentence as problematic is they basically parse it according to a context-free grammar, similar to what I showed you before. And if they can't generate this sentence up here when they, when they perform the parsing, if they are left with, let's say, just two verb phrases or a verb phrase followed by a verb phrase, well, according to the rules of the grammar, that doesn't create a sentence. And so they would tell you this sentence is invalid because when I ran through the whole thing, I didn't get a noun phrase followed by a verb phrase, so there must be a problem with what you did. Okay, but that's just in the context of grammar checking, more typically these parse trees serve as an important intermediary step of representation for semantic analysis. So that's how you derive meaning from a text. And so anything from question answering systems to information extraction, parsing uh, your, your text so that you can extract information about uh, the likely subject candidates and the links between the subject and the object is is usually critical. Okay, I might, for instance, want to extract customer suggestions or commands from search history records. These are almost always imperative in their structure. That is, they begin with a verb phrase and have no subject. So you could, you could see how I could construct, um, if I knew something about the qualities or the, the, the structure of the language, I could try to specifically seek out the imperative components of the sentences or imperative sentences, which are those that begin with a verb phrase and have no subject. And, and I could extract those from a very long, complicated text. So here's some examples of imperatives. Show the latest movies. Give me yesterday's news. List all flights between 5 and 7 p.m. Note here that if I wanted to do this with a deep net, it would probably take massive, I mean, absolutely massive amounts of training data in order to get the network to learn that all three of these are imperative in their structure, right? But with some very clever, simple setting of the rules and taking advantage of, of what we know about, about language and its structure, we can, we can generate a system that does this very fast and incredibly reliably using a context-free grammar. Okay, let's work through another example. Um, let's say I want to extract all yes or no questions from some historical call transcripts. So, um, well, we might take advantage of the fact that such questions tend to start with an auxiliary verb, followed by a subject noun phrase, followed by a verb noun phrase. And so it, if we specified a, um, 
if we had specified our context-free grammar appropriately, we'd be able to very quickly sift through a bunch of text to extract all the yes-no questions, like, did you try resetting the machine? Does your computer feel warm to the touch? Can you tell me how much RAM you have? And once again, doing this with a deep learning approach would be very, very challenging in the absence of a very large number of labeled training examples. OK, let's think through one more example. Um, we might be interested, for example, in extracting uh, and organizing all open what they call WH phrase questions from a work of philosophy. So these are questions that contain a noun phrase followed by a verb phrase, but where the first word in the noun phrase starts with one of the what they call WH words. So who, what, where, when, how, why, etc. And we could specify um, the correct structure in our context-free grammar and uh, be able to extract these from a very large and complicated text. You know, we could extract all three of these questions. What programming languages are best for new coders? Which Python library should I be familiar with? What is the point of GitHub? And I bring all these examples to your attention, not really to, to you know, beat a dead horse, but just to emphasize that you can oftentimes take advantage of the structure of language uh, to very simply with uh, a couple of rules, solve a problem that it would take an incredible amount of data to solve with a deep network or a transformer or something of that variety. And so your familiarity with these classical techniques will help you hopefully be able to distinguish between when you need to bring out uh, something like a transformer to solve a problem versus when you can use a regular expression or a context-free grammar to get 95% of the way there.